Welcome everybody to another BAPT In Conversation webinar. My name is Richard Owen and I'm current treasurer of the BAPT, the British Association for Psychological Type. We're a registered charity here in the UK and we're here to spread uh, best practice and knowledge about psychological type. And tonight we've got a guest from uh, who's comes from California, but is now currently at this present point calling us from the East Coast, I believe, in the States. Um, Carol Shume is a type expert uh, practitioner and university lecturer on the subject. Uh, she's got a new book coming out soon that she's going to tell us about. And she's the co-editor co of Personality Type in Depth. And it's very much into uh, the, the mixing of depth, psychology, and type. So welcome, Carol. Thank you. And um, what I really want to talk about is how I got into this. Um, because my um, type journey is, uh, I actually discovered empirical evidence for psychological type and for aspects of Jungian theory just by experiencing them before I had the words, before I knew anything about Jung. This started when I was in grad school. I went to grad school right after college and um, I had um, an experience of my unconscious in grad school. That was my first Jungian discovery, although I didn't know that's what it was. Uh, I was doing, I had done all of the research for my master's thesis, and I was in the process of organizing it to write it up. And I lost it. I lost all of it. It just disappeared. And I, I mean, it was so uncanny. It was bizarre. And then I was really, um, I was depressed for a couple of days and I realized I had a choice. I could either drop out of grad school or I could try to recall from memory everything that was in that research. And as an ENFP, memory is my inferior function, introverted sensing. <laughs> so I really didn't want to go there. I did not want to do it. But I finally realized if I was going to do it, I was going to have to do it fast before it slipped out of my memory bank. So I started writing as fast as I could. And I had an amazing experience in that, of reconstituting this whole thing from memory. Of course, I didn't have the page numbers. I mean, I didn't, you know, all of the data that is supposed to be there. I had to go back to the library and re research everything. But that was how I did my master's thesis. But the thing that really stayed with me, I, I was wondering how this had happened, but it proved to me there was this thing called the unconscious, that I had gone so unconscious that I had completely disappeared something from my material world. And I had this dim understanding that this may have happened because I was trying too hard. And I started kind of researching that for actually for my PhD dissertation. And I had a term for it, I called it the perversity principle. And it basically what I wrote about it is that the degree of effort applied toward the pursuit of a goal is inversely proportional to the degree of success in the outcome, which is, sounds like complete nonsense. But I mean, you could say the harder you try, the more you fail. Now, this is obviously not the case with most people, but it seemed to be the case with me and I was wondering why. But I began to discover that this principle um, was a key principle in Greek drama. And then in subsequent eras, even in medieval literature, which I was studying, um, and the Greeks had a term for it, and that term is enantiodromia. And Jung, of course, picked up that term 
But I didn't know that yet. But I was very excited to find that Greek term. Okay, so that was my first discovery, the unconscious. And you can put the slide on if you want. I was just going to ask you a question about that. So the antiodromia, from what I know about it, is, is things flipping to their opposite. Is, yes. is that how you'd see it? Yes, <laughs> things flipping to their opposite. And, so, uh, um, the idea of the unconscious, I'm thinking that you're talking about there, you know, being that trying, you trying too hard is less likely to succeed. So what is likely to see, succeed is, is that a sense of like going with flow, like a flow state yeah. that is not yeah. something deliberate and effortful? Yes, and so when Jung talks about, um, in psychological types, when he talks about one-sidedness and overdoing a function, and, and he found Nietzsche to be the prime example of this, um, that what happens is if you, if you go into overdrive on any function, at some point, the opposite, the inferior function, which is opposite in both kind and attitude, gets pushed into the unconscious. And at some point, suddenly, that superior function, our dominant function, will collapse and the, the inferior function will erupt out of the unconscious in unpleasant ways, out of control. Mm. And so that's kind of the connection between an antiodromia and um, the mental functions. Mm. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. no, that's good. Yeah, I mean, I could, I, could, uh, I could expand on it, but what I'm interested in is seeing how your... Um your slides are going to help us to continue on on this theme so i'm just going to share it now well the slides may not help quite I didn't well this this is the horrific slide of number one which you've prepared and i'd like you to explain how this relates to the uh okay well i'm not seeing it on mine um uh, but okay let me try again i know what it is but i Meaning. Let me ask any of the attendees if they want, if they can see it or not, because uh, mm -hmm. ask them. We can message now. I've just done it again. Are we having a bad day for sharing, or is it working? That's very interesting. She can see it. Catherine says she can see okay. it. Okay. So I know what it is. So. Yeah. <laughs> this historic photograph I just love, uh, shows a man with a knife in his hand, holding his head in the other hand. I mean, he's cut off his head with his own knife. And I think that's really a, a wonderful image of the kind of unconsciousness that I experienced because my unconsciousness was self-inflicted. And I think that's very often the case. Um, and the, um, there's a wonderful um, proverb of La Fontaine, which goes, um, the, you, you meet your destiny on the road you take to avoid it, <laughs> which I think expresses the essence of that. And when Jung was um, of that enantiodromia thing that happens, um, Jung actually made an explicit connection between enantiodromia and the trickster. Because the trickster is, our, is the archetype within us that um, sabotages us. But it sabotages us to save us. And in my case with this, this thesis business, I had reached an impasse. I had all of my thesis research um, and I had it for weeks and I couldn't move forward on actually writing it. So then my inner trickster helpfully stepped in and lost it for me. Jung also uses the term poltergeist for the trickster and I think that's a really good term for that, when I read that, I said, that's it. That's what happened to me. But jumping ahead a little bit, I want to go back to my first experience was the unconscious, and I didn't understand it. My second experience was an experience of type, 
when I was teaching writing. And I began to realize I could anticipate the kind of mistakes that people would make by their general um, demeanor in the classroom. And I could see these different personalities knowing nothing about type. And I had little names for them in my head. There were the list makers, there were the debaters, there were the idea generators and so forth. And then a colleague told me, oh, Jung has terms for those. That's extrovert, introverted sensation and extroverted thinking and extroverted intuition. And I was stunned because I really did discover it from experiencing it. So then I began to read up about type. And my first teacher in that score was Ann Loomis, who I mentioned she's because she's an uh, ESFP, extroverted sensing type. Ann was a walking encyclopedia on type and also on Jung. She was president of the Jung Society for many years. So she really always had those two things in mind. And so she was a great teacher. But I still didn't understand anything about what had happened to me in grad school. And I didn't know anything about Jungian psychology. I've started using type, but Jung remained um, unclear to me until I met another sensing type this time an introverted sensing type, and that was Bob McAlpin. And Bob uh, showed me that my understanding of psychological type was really rather primitive. And he said, you really need to come to a workshop with John Beebe. Mm -hmm. So I went to this workshop and then when John started talking about the trickster, I had this moment of revelation. Oh my goodness, that is what happened to me in graduate school. My trickster entered in. So then I had the two pieces of Jungian psychology. I had the unconscious and an archetypal experience, and I had the conscious ego functions that psychological type focuses on. So ever since then, my, my mission has been to bring those two together. Um, for me, in my own mind, because it's never easy, but also out in the world. Mm. So. Yeah, so you've got the, you, so you, you just, you already had the unconscious as a clear aspect in your understanding from the start. And I'm interested in now, like why we have the term like psych, psychological type in in depth or depth typology or you know i'm just curious about where perhaps you know the myers-briggs angle took things that means we have to now explicitly say that there is a need for depth or that it includes it whereas obviously jung had that as part of his wider model from the start you know so yes well if you go to my slides go down to the slides that shows jung's model let me skip down to that one yeah, can you see? Yeah. So Jung always had this idea of the unconscious um, and the functions, the mental functions, I, I think of them as kind of floating on the sea of the unconscious. They're on the surface. So, you know, when they don't all float to the top at the same time, though. When, when one comes up, opposite its opposite functions are down so down in the unconscious so he saw this kind of movement uh, up and down in the functions and um, so he had this eight function model but he also knew there was an auxiliary function so in his head he did have an idea of a 16 type model and he even referenced it at one point mentioned it. But um, in addition to that, he of course talked about the archetypes at length, existing down in the unconscious. But the only archetype that he really um, specifically correlated with uh, a function was 
the anima animus. And that, it, it, he very specifically correlated that with the inferior function. I think he used the term hero quite often um, when he was talking about um, the superior function, but the correlation is a little less clear there. But certainly he had that idea in mind. And if you go to the next slide, you see Myers-Briggs model. Myers-Briggs identified the auxiliary function and that created the 16 types. That was really what Jung had in mind. And I think um, Isabel Myers and Catherine Briggs knew very well that of course the unconscious is a big part of things. One of the reasons that they created this model was to help people see that, to help people see that if you're using your superior function, your inferior function is going to be down low, and that there are even aspects of your primary function that you're not aware of. For example, most of us don't even know we have functions, let alone what they are. So she was they were very well aware of the unconscious, but they were trying to codify Jung's system and make it acceptable to a wide audience. And I think, I think they did a beautiful job. Um, so adding the auxiliary function made 16 types. And of course, we all use the type codes. Incidentally, I've, I've blacked out the tertiary uh, function there only because um, my students find it confusing. Um, but when Myers uh, created her type model, she had the tertiary function uh, in the same attitude as the inferior function. And um, so because I'm using um, the BB model in my classes, I, I blocked that off. But I do know that people, there's a perfectly uh, legitimate um, theory that says that the tertiary is in the same attitude. Um, I happen to use the B model. Mm -hmm. Anyway, what was missing from the Myers model is the unconscious. Um, and Hans Isaac, who's a personality theorist, uh, said he, he critiqued her model on this ground. Um, so if you, if you look then at the next slide, the BB model fills that in. The BB model provides that missing unconscious aspect. Um, and Jung made the most remarkable uh, um, statement, I think. He said, the shadow is the third dimension of personality. And so I'd like to use this figure to show how the BB model provides for us the third dimension of personality type. Mm -hmm. So the functions that are on this lower level are the opposite attitude siblings of the ego conscious functions. And BB also identified more archetypes around them. Um, he didn't do that single-handedly. Um, and I actually think that's a strength of his model that he didn't just impose these, he actually got a lot of feedback there were other people like Laura McGrew, a Jungian analyst, who suggested that the sixth function is, has rich energy. And um, Lenore Thompson, who said that the third function has, um, is kind of the irresponsibility function, and she described it in childlike terms. Um, but Bibi pretty much codified that with the language, the terms, the archetypes. And of course, he did extra research and discovered uh, archetypal energies that no one had before. So, I mean, he made associations between known archetypes, the most common archetypes, and the functions. It's interesting, this three-dimensional aspect. I, I get that. It adds a, the depth, literally, you know, and... What I'm interested in is like really make, trying to get clear on your, how you understand the term unconscious. You, you already made a reference to it is how you know, an aspect had, had sort of come up, which you, you were doing things that you were not really aware of, I guess, during your thesis. Something happened, like you, 
you managed to lose something and whatever you did to lose it you kind of were not present with that happening it was happening out of your yes awareness and is that how you would, would define the unconscious like it is it's when things are happening that you are not presently aware of in in a reflexive sense well i mean let me that's how i experience it um jung said the unconscious is both uh, personal and transpersonal. So there's the archetypal unconscious, the collective unconscious, which is everything that we have inherited um, from the human, human race. And then we have our personal unconscious, which um, develops out of our um, consciousness. Now, Bibi says consciousness is an emergent property of the unconscious. I guess for me, I saw it the other way around. For me, I, I was conscious and then somehow the unconscious emerged out of that. But um, the way I envision it is as a kind of mirror opposite of consciousness which I think is how Jung describes it. So that um, however much we make conscious, um, you know, we're always raising our consciousness. We're always trying to become more conscious about things we were not aware of yesterday. And now maybe we are aware of them but the more we do that, it seems to me that the unconscious continues to grow equally large. I don't think consciousness can ever outgrow the unconscious. At least that's what I understand of Bibi's model, because he said the unconscious compensates consciousness. So in order for it to play a compensatory role, a balancing role, it must be equal in size, but I, I truthfully don't really understand that. I don't understand how that happens. And it's very hard for me to make sense of that when I think of development and growth. And um, integration, oh my goodness, there's another big, <laughs> big term. Maybe you can write about that and explain it. <laughs> well, I guess there's the, there's the, um, you know, the theory of like, what is the unconscious and where it comes from? And I guess I'm getting to what is the everyday experience of it or the, or the non-experience of it, because that's the point. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a contradiction because it's a non-experience. It's, it's the thing that you're actually trying to become aware of. Right. Be aware of the mind carrying you off into experiences which you're not present with. And you may suddenly catch yourself in. And it's a very strange concept for people that haven't actually experienced that even though it's quite easy to get a handle on if you do any kind of mindfulness ex exercises or anything where you suddenly become aware that we're not just this conscious rational agent making deliberate decisions all the time our mind is wondering and getting carried away and doing things so that we're so absorbed in it almost constantly and then we're sort of we're almost interluding within that with our conscious mind directing uh, things with an awareness that we actually feel is intentional. And the rest of the time, we're kind of sleepwalking almost through life. And it, it, it's quite a scary concept for people that kind of, and, and I can understand why people would deny that it even happens or exists. Yeah, um, I, and I think um, Jung saw such a, um, so much value in the unconscious. I mean, that's part of what distinguished him from Freud. And he had this, um, this phrase from, from, I think it was from Genet, that French psychologist, um, abaissement du niveau mental, the lowering of the threshold of consciousness. And this can be like everything in Jung, it can be a, a negative thing or it can be a positive thing. And 
you know, it seems that we have to experience that lowering of consciousness in order to allow um, the unconscious to have its say and in order to be receptive to insights that come out of the unconscious. So when Jung says um, in Memory Streams Reflections, he says at this point when he had his midlife crisis, he said, I could not even read a scientific book. I had to just let myself be carried along. And um, I think what he was saying to us, he was talking about Tao, which is often the Tao or Tao, often described as a river or a stream that carries us along. And the term that he um, discovered in Asian philosophies was, and I really don't know how to pronounce this, Wu Wei, W U hyphen W E I E. And he talks about that, Wu Wei, and what it means. It's, it's, you could translate it in modern day English as effortless action, but it's a way of relaxing into the flow, as you say, but still somehow being active. But in order to do that, you do have to let go of that, um, that will, which Jung was very clear that um, willpower is antithetical to the individuation process. Mm. Yeah, so. yeah I like that. Well, yeah, Wu Wei, the concept is, as I've read it is, like you said, it's, it's, it's been described as a, a getting out of the way of nature, you know, you know get, yeah. stop, stop getting in the way of what's naturally un, un, happening and emerging. Yes. So um, I think if we think of it in type terms, we can think of it as uh, relinquishing our hold on the superior function. <clears throat> and um, allowing the other functions to come up to consciousness. Only, they will only come up if we, if we let go of that top one. Now, don't ask me to do that right now. <laughs> 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 I think I would just be silly and stupid in this interview. But um, I try to be open to whatever is going to happen. So if there are questions or um, you know, if something crazy went on, I would say, wow, I wonder what that means. And where did that come from? And did I have any say in that? Did I have any responsibility for that? So how, how might this work then with the shadow, the functions which are potentially disturbing and destructive and uncomfortable that almost we've potentially had to suppress and learn to, to, to stop emerging be, because they've caused problems in our lives, you know, potentially when we were even young babies or children, um, you know, so we've packed them away. Um, so how can we kind of productively allow those to emerge without yeah. see, running into problems? Yeah. Yeah, that's a big question, and I think it's probably has to be answered individually, each person for himself. I think you, Jung, and, and especially if you read um, someone like Donald Kalshed, who works with children who are survivors of trauma, he, I mean, reading his case histories is like discovering incredible evidence for the archetypes and their activity in us, because he sees them in the dreams of his patients. So um, he says that his patients have, and this is very interesting because it you know, reflects Bibi's model, he has both um, demonic creatures and beneficent creatures. And the term that BB uses for the beneficent side of that archetype is daimonic. So, I mean, um, Kalashid says 
I mean, if these are archetypes, they're coming up from the collective unconscious. And he says, these are um, inside of us to, um, to help us um, or to harm us. It can be both. I mean, we have both of those. And I don't know how to make sense of that truthfully, but he has so much evidence for it in his books that I, I think it is true. And I think when Jung writes cautiously about his clients and how, you know, you have to be careful not to integrate certain things, you don't want to integrate um, an archetype probably don't want to integrate any archetype. Um, that needs to remain <laughs> in the collective unconscious. Um, you can become slightly aware of it, but Jung says that people can become possessed by an archetype. I mean, so even if it's a positive archetype, you don't want to be possessed by it because then you lose your individuality. And I think that was the worst fate that could befall somebody is, is my reading of Jung, that then you just become fused with the archetype. Mm, you become a caricature of. Yeah. And, and I guess that's why people recognize, you know, it makes for good films and so on, mm. where characters come up that are so, yes. on, you know, one way of, of behaving in a very caric caricatured way. Right. And I think when Jung talked about being possessed by an archetype, it's absolutely uh, riveting to read that because as he's describing it, you just know, I think he was writing that in the late 20s and or maybe, no, maybe he wrote most of that right after the war. You can just see he's got Hitler in mind, that Hitler was that kind of archetypally possessed person. And um, he said, when, an individual becomes possessed by the archetype, he takes on all of these attributes that are not his, that belong to the archetype. So then he seems larger than life and more powerful and charismatic and all of that. And I think for me, this explains so much of why we see um, crazy people becoming powerful political leaders because they, have allowed themselves to become possessed by some archetype. And I guess, like you said, because collectively we all have those aspects within us, uh, then it, it triggers that in us, you know, it awakens that, that aspects in us. It becomes contagious, as like Jung wrote a lot about that kind of thing. Right. And so what I see, I think Jung gave us an amazing antidote to this with his psychological types. I think type and the mental functions, they're so specific, they're so real world. It's the antidote to that underbelly of our psyche um, that we need. We need the archetypes, but we also need the directed functions. We need to have ego consciousness and we need to have preferences. I mean, Jung, I think, is very clear that we need that differentiating preferences early on is part of the individuation process. At one point, he says individuation is a process of uh, differentiation. So when we differentiate those preferences, yes, we may go into excess with them, but that's a necessary phase of development that helps us. Um, one way it helps us is um, when he talks about participation, participation mystique, um, and he says we can, you know, this is the uh, state of primitive man, which, by the way, I don't think he denigrates primitive man at all. I think he says we all need to be more in touch with our instincts like primitive man was. But this participation mystique where the primitive man sort of merges with his environment. Jung says we need to develop extroversion and introversion because that's what enables us to see what is outside as outside and what is inside as inside. And only then can we see and understand what our projections are. And so for me, 
um, Jung's typology is just this brilliant scheme which enables us to actually see our projections. And we can see them by knowing our psychological type and then realizing, oh, the functions we don't like so well, well, we project them negatively onto other people and generally we project them onto other people who have those functions as they're um, higher up in their type. So then we begin to realize we have biases against other personalities. And when we discover that, then we discover, oh my goodness, we have biases against those parts of ourselves. So we haven't, you know, fully accessed all the assets that are available to us by keeping some of those functions down. That's, that's a wonderful description of, of exactly what the phenomena of type is, what the problem is, is how we recognize it. Yes. You know, what he was trying to get to with all of this, really, yeah. This, this, this qualitative relationship to certain aspects of, of ways of being yes. within us and within other people. So we get that clash, that, that polarity and, and, that, and that clash that we see all around us today in politics and on the internet. And <laughs> I mean, we see our political leaders constantly projecting their own problems onto other people. <laughs> And it's so real, but yeah, you know, people would deny, some people would deny that type's even a thing, but I think the way you've just described it, you know, that is, we need to go back to rooting it in, well, this is the phenomena you can see so clearly, and this is the theory that was designed to explain and understand it. Yes, yeah. What I'd love to do, we've got um, maybe about seven minutes left, is just going back to the slides and... Um, I really want you to tell us a little bit about your book that's coming up. I'm going to put up a slide of the title now um, because I know you've been working very hard on this and uh, it's coming out quite soon. Uh, is it being published? Here we go. Published by Routledge. When mm -hmm. is the publication date? Um, August um, is the projected date. Maybe, I mean, I hope it would be sooner, but I don't know. I haven't actually turned it in yet. I've written it and I've done all the figures but I am um, still getting feedback from people. So, um, and uh, oh, some people in British APT have been very helpful. Um, Roy Childs and John Haxton, I'm very grateful for their feedback on the, I have a science chapter, <laughs> and uh, which I felt that I had to write because there's so much negative press about the MBTI an MBTI type that I thought I could see people really don't understand it. And so I, I just, I didn't want to do that, but I had to, you know, take on that as an argument and make an argument on behalf of Jung's theory and also of Myers and Briggs's uh, work, which I, I think their work was pretty brilliant. Um, anyway, um, what, what aspect of the, slides do you want to talk about well yeah well then you're well, just following on from that then in your book what um if there was one key way that uh type and Mount myers briggs was misunderstood today in in the scientific community what would that be do you think yeah oh, gosh um <laughs> no i'm just I've well, one that you're interested in most from your book what something that my chapter um i think um they um well i make the point and and this is a point that jung made first so i'm only repeating it jung said the only kind of thinking that Western civilization recognizes is the extroverted kind of thinking. And he saw all of civilization post uh, enlightenment as being an extroverted thinking uh, dominated um, enterprise. And extroverted thinking as we know um, prioritizes measurable results and, and um, clarity and um, well you've got extroverted thinking in the second position you tell me what it is you're more adept with it than I am um, but it, it 
uh, it's definitive, it's clear. I mean, when I first started studying Jung, I've got it in the third position. So I, I'm also always trying to, I'm always getting frustrated when Jung goes, on the one hand, a, but on the other hand, B, you know, it's like a both hand thing. And I'm going, yes, but what is it? Is it black or white? Um, <clears throat> so I'm very much a product of Cartesian rationalism. Um, but I think what Jung is saying is that our, <coughs> our academic disciplines have been very one-sided to be dominated by this. And he's not the only person that has said this. There are psychologists who have said this too. And so um, I do point that out in there. But their big uh, beef with Myers-Briggs is that um, they find the MBTI to be, um, you know, producing insufficient, it's not quantitative, right? It doesn't produce quantifiable uh, entities that can then be put into a, a computer program. Um, so, yeah, I get, I get your point. You know that the very psychological processes that we're talking about can underlie worldviews and and about anything, including science. And and you know when when you sort of take a, a particular line of of how reality should be, then obviously you kind of exclude others. And that's, I guess, where you're coming from. Hopefully, with this, I think. Right. And really, um, I, if you read um, some, of, some of the scholars writing about the social sciences and psychology say, this is a complete misunderstanding of what science is. Science isn't just um, experiments that produce measurable results, which kind of describes what a lot of behavioral research does and incidentally i love behavioral research i love to read about it all the time but doing experiments that's only one side you also have to have the theoretical side and so um i think to criticize jung's theory because um the myers briggs doesn't always produce um results that are the same every time it, it's kind of like criticizing um einstein's theory because we don't have um telescopes that can see gravity waves you know i mean they're critiquing Jung's theory because of the instrument used to assess it i it's just i mean to me that's crazy but <laughs> I, I, I really look forward to reading that that um in your book actually and I just want to show another couple of things that you've got slides you've given us for what okay. to expect. So you're going to have some stuff about body language and being able to recognize how type preferences can affect that as well. Yes, I, I have a lot about body language in the book because, um, and, and I think this, this comes right out of Myers and Briggs. This was one of their discoveries. You know, judgment and perception were already part of Jung's theory, but Myers and Briggs, um, when they developed this type code, which is crazy in some way and very difficult to teach and get people to understand, um, but because of the type code with J's and P's on the ends, they discovered this pattern that Jung himself hadn't even seen which is that J's seek closure and P's seek uh, openness. And that has all kinds of uh, implications for, um, um, and it, it expresses in physically, in body language. And it was really Paul Teeger's book, Paul and Barbara Teeger's book that, that uh, made that clear to me. They first did all the work on that. Um, Paul Teeger is, was a, uh, jury consultant, and he would help um, lawyers understand who to select for a jury. He would figure out their type just from seeing them walk into a room. Um, then I have taken that and identified um, um, body language and um, facial animation and gestures um, associated with the different mental functions. Now, 
what I don't know is, for example, I can see that uh, introverted thinking types have a very characteristic way of using their eyes, both the ISTPs and the INTPs. What I don't know is whether all of us have that mm, have that attribute when we're using an introverted thinking function. I don't know. But I can certainly see a lot of evidence of, um, I'm trying to make conscious what we Thai practitioners do all the time unconsciously. And I think Thai practitioners do this very well, and I think it's thanks to Myers and Briggs' research. Um, I think Thai practitioners see dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of people that they assess. And so then they can begin to identify um, types just from, from meeting them, just from seeing them. And they get a really good sense of whether somebody's reported type is really the true type or not. And I met people at APTI conferences way back when who were just amazing at that. So I knew it was possible. So I'm trying to increase my ability in that regard. That's fascinating stuff. And then lastly, this is the another um, aspect. So this is you describing from Bibi's model what to expect from the different functions showing up with the particular archetypes in yes. all the different configurations, which I know is a, a huge task. There's 64 different combinations. And is it something that you're publishing all of those in your book? Yes. And the, I had to take a very small section to get it onto the slide and make it readable. Um, mm. This, uh, the introverted sensing in the third position, um, that is a full page of text in, in the book. So I had to squeeze it down quite a bit. I got this information originally. Um, it, it started with a database of um, information that I compiled from when I was working with Bob McAlpin and Type Resources. And Type Resources co-sponsored or, or sponsored uh, BB workshops. And uh, so the participants in those workshops, in those early workshops, BB did this wonderful thing. They would last for, you know, four, three or four days. I mean, we would go through every single archetype um, in some workshops. Or in other workshops, we'd go through every single function. And um, so um, the reports that participants made from those workshops was a good beginning. Now, what was missing from those workshops, though, a lot of what was missing was sensing types. <laughs> you know, we didn't have very many sensing types. So I had to do a lot of extra research on that. And um, incidentally, I find that sensing types are among the best um, at identifying psychological type through body language. And maybe it's because they pay attention to that literal uh, level of reality. They see these small changes in the face and so forth. That's amazing. So I learned a lot from uh, sensing types about psychological type. And when I have a problem figuring out someone's type, I have um, an extroverted, sen two extroverted sensing types that I go to. One is an ISFP and the other one is an ESFP. So I'm, I'm not sure why that is, but they seem to be really good at it. Um, That's fascinating. So it's a really packed book with all kinds of <laughs> really like forward thinking stuff in it. And I'm really looking forward to having reading a copy of that in, in the summer this year, summer 2020. I'm very kind to say so. Projection and personality. So yeah, we're looking forward to that. So best of luck with the rest of that, finishing it and editing it and everything. Thank you very much.
I'd love to uh, continue the conversation, but sadly we've gone a bit over time and Great. gonna have to, have to end say. this. <laughs> but are you coming over still to the conference in April in the UK? Yes, I am. I'm giving a presentation on type and body language. Well, there we go. So we, and I think that's good because we've seen a bit of that last year and, and seeing the videos actually brings it to life. So that sounds like a really interesting talk. And that's the BAPT conference, April this year in Milton Keynes, the UK. So it's now open for booking and registration. We've got people registering. So if anyone out there wants to get a place, now's the time to do it. Um, yeah, well, we'll see you soon then in the UK. And um, all the best. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Great. Thanks, Carol. Cheers. Bye-bye.